Hi, I'm Lily, and I'm 31 years old. I just got married to Larry, who is 9 years older than me. But let's go back a little, shall we? Let me tell you about the day Larry and I first met. It was at one of those fancy garden parties our parents loved to host. I was 20, just out of high school, and Larry was 29, the new rising star at his father's company. I remember him walking up to me with a glass of champagne in his hand. Lily Wright, he asked, his voice smooth as silk. I've heard a lot about you. I blushed, unsure of what to say. And you're Larry. I've heard a lot about you too, I replied. He laughed, a sound that made my heart skip a beat. Hopefully all good things, he said. We spent the rest of the evening talking, laughing, and, to my surprise, connecting in a way I hadn't expected. That night, our parents saw us together and started thinking about us getting married. It took a few more years, but eventually, their plan worked out. Before we got married, we signed a prenuptial agreement. It was straightforward. If one of us cheated, the other could end the marriage and walk away with $7 million. I had no intention of cheating, so I signed it without a second thought. I remember the day we signed that agreement. My dad, a man of few words, but with a big heart, looked at me with concern. Are you sure you're okay with this, Lily? He asked, his voice steady but with a hint of worry. Dad, it's fine, I reassured him, giving him a quick hug. I trust Larry and he trusts me. This is just a formality. Larry was there too, and he was the one who insisted on signing the paper. I don't want you to feel pressured, Lily, he said, his voice sounding a bit tense. If you're not comfortable with this, we can talk about it more. But I just shook my head and smiled at him. Larry, I'm fine with it, I said. I trust you, I said. He seemed relieved and gave me a warm smile. And I trust you, Lily, he replied. That was the beginning of our journey together. We got married in a grand ceremony that everyone talked about. I was excited about starting this new chapter in my life, completely unaware of the storm that was on the horizon. After the wedding, we moved into a beautiful house just outside the city. It felt like a dream come true living with Larry and waking up next to him every morning. He was sweet, caring, and for a while, everything seemed perfect. Our honeymoon was like something out of a fairy tale. We spent three weeks at a gorgeous beach resort, soaking up the sun and enjoying each other's company. But when we returned home, things began to change. Larry became a different person distant, always lost in thought. He started coming home late from work and would go straight to bed without even saying goodnight. We began sleeping in separate rooms, eating at different times, and barely talking to each other. One day, I decided to confront him. Larry, I said, trying to keep my voice steady, what's going on? You've been acting strange ever since we got back from our honeymoon. He looked at me, his eyes no longer filled with the warmth they once had. I've just been busy with work, Lily, he replied, avoiding eye contact. But we hardly talk anymore, I continued. We're living like strangers in our own home. He sighed, running his fingers through his hair. I know, Lily. I'm sorry. I'll try to make more time for us. But nothing changed. In fact, things got worse. Larry started coming home even later, sometimes not until the early morning. He stopped eating with me, and we barely saw each other. I began to have doubts. Was he seeing someone else? The thought made me feel sick, but I couldn't ignore the signs. I decided to confront him again. Larry, I said one night when he came home late, are you seeing someone else? He looked shocked by my question. What? No, Lily, I would never do that to you. Then why are you always out? You never spend time with me, I said, tears filling my eyes. I told you, it's just work, he said firmly. I'm not cheating on you, Lily but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Larry was not the same man I had married. He was distant, cold, and seemed to be hiding something. I didn't know what to do. I loved Larry, but I couldn't keep living like this. I decided to start investigating. If Larry wasn't going to tell me what was happening, I needed to find out for myself. 
I began by checking his phone when he was in the shower. I felt guilty for invading his privacy, but I was desperate for answers. I didn't find any suspicious messages or calls, but I did find something that made my heart sink Larry had been searching for apartments. Was he planning to leave me? I confronted him about it. Larry, why are you looking for apartments? Are you planning on leaving me? He looked shocked. No, Lily, I was just looking. I wasn't planning on leaving you. Then why were you looking? I asked, my voice trembling. I don't know, Lily, he said, barely whispering. I just need some space. One day, I decided to talk to my mom about it. She's always been my support, the person I turn to when things get tough. Mom, I said, I don't know what to do. Larry has changed. He's not the same person anymore. My mom listened, concern written all over her face. Lily, she said, you're both still adjusting. You're newlyweds. It takes time to build a life together. I wanted to believe her, to think that this was just a phase and that things would get better. But deep down, I knew there was more to it. Larry was hiding something. I could feel it. I tried to push the feeling away, tried to convince myself that mom was right. But the nagging voice in the back of my mind wouldn't go away, constantly reminding me that something was off. Three weeks later, I gathered my courage and approached Larry. I need a job. I said, looking him in the eye. He seemed surprised. You want to work? He asked, raising an eyebrow. I nodded. Yes, I need to do something, Larry. I can't just sit at home all day. He thought for a moment, then said, I can offer you a job at my foundation. We help kids in tough situations. Would you be interested? I was surprised. Larry's foundation was well known for its work with children and I had always admired what they did. Yes, I said without hesitation, I'd love to. Working at the foundation was a breath of fresh air. I was busy, and I was doing something meaningful. I met kids who were strong and resilient, kids who had gone through more hardships than any child should. It was heartbreaking, but also inspiring. The job kept me busy and helped me take my mind off the problems at home. Larry and I were struggling, but at least during the day, I had something else to focus on. The work was tough and emotionally draining, but it was worth it. I felt like I was making a difference, like I was doing something important. For the first time in a long while, I felt happy. But even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Larry was acting strange and distant. I couldn't figure out what it was, but I knew something was off, and I was determined to find out. With a heavy heart full of questions and doubts, I decided to hire a private detective. I needed to know if Larry was cheating on me. It wasn't just about my pride. It was about my peace of mind. I couldn't live with constant uncertainty, always wondering what had gone wrong. There was also the prenup we signed before getting married. If Larry was cheating, it wouldn't just be a betrayal, it would be a costly mistake. I found a detective agency in the city run by a man named Tyler. He was an ex-cop, a seasoned veteran with a sharp eye and a no-nonsense attitude. I told him my story and my suspicions. He listened, his face expressionless. I'll do my best, Lily, he said when I finished, but I can't promise anything. If your husband is cheating, he's doing a good job of hiding it. I nodded, understanding. I just need to know, Tyler. One way or another, I need to know. I remember the day he came back to give me his report. His face was serious, his eyes filled with sympathy. I'm sorry, Lily, he said. I couldn't find any evidence that your husband is cheating on you. I felt a strange mix of relief and disappointment. Part of me was glad that Larry wasn't cheating, but another part of me was frustrated. If he wasn't cheating, then why did he leave? What was he hiding? Are you sure, Tyler? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. There's nothing at all. Tyler shook his head. I'm sorry, Lily. I know this isn't what you wanted to hear. I thanked Tyler and paid him for his services. As I watched him leave, I felt a deep sense of loss. I was back where I started, with more questions than answers. One day, while I was working at a charity event, a new guy walked in. 
His name was John. He was handsome, with a smile that could light up the room. He was smart, with a quick wit and sharp mind. He was funny, with a sense of humor that made everyone laugh. He looked like a famous actor, with his chiseled features and striking good looks. In short, he was my ideal man. But despite being drawn to John, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. His arrival seemed too perfect, too convenient. I couldn't help but think about Larry and our prenup. If I was caught cheating, I'd have to pay a huge sum of seven million dollars. Could John be a trap set by Larry to catch me? I decided to hire Tyler, the private detective I had used before. I asked him to investigate John and see if he had any connections to Larry. Tyler agreed to take the case and started digging into John's past and connections. He followed him, watched his movements and interactions. Tyler was thorough, leaving no stone unturned. In the meantime, I tried to keep my distance from John. It was hard, especially since he was so charming and attractive, but I had to be careful. I couldn't afford to fall into a trap, not when so much was at stake. One day, John asked me out for coffee. I was torn. Part of me wanted to say yes, to get to know him better. But another part of me was scared, worried about what Tyler might find. I'd love to, John, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. But I'm really busy right now. Maybe some other time. John seemed disappointed but didn't push. Sure, Lily, he said, his smile fading a bit. Some other time. I felt a pang of guilt. What if I was wrong? What if John was just a nice guy, and I was letting my suspicions ruin something good? But I couldn't take the risk, not until I knew for sure. Five days later, Tyler came to give me his report. His face was serious, his eyes hard. I'm sorry, Lily, he said, but your suspicions were right. John is working for your husband. I felt a rush of emotions anger at Larry for trying to trap me relief that I hadn't fallen for it, and sadness that John wasn't who I thought he was. But above all, I felt a sense of vindication. I wasn't imagining things my suspicions were real. Thank you, Tyler, I said, my voice catching with emotion. You've done a great job. As I watched Tyler leave, I felt a strange sense of closure. I had dodged a bullet and avoided a costly mistake but I also felt like I'd lost something the idea of the perfect man and the hope of finding love again. It was a hard truth to accept, but I wasn't going to let it bring me down. I was stronger than that. I was determined to move on and find happiness again. I didn't need an ideal man. I just needed someone who was real and honest, and I was going to find that person no matter what. Instead of sending John packing right then, I decided to take a different approach. I chose to play along and befriend him, all while keeping my behavior above board, so Larry would have no reason to accuse me of anything. John, however, took my friendliness as a sign of something more. He started to relax, thinking he had me fooled. The irony was that he was the one being played, but I didn't let him in on the secret. I couldn't risk him running back to Larry, so I kept up the act and maintained a friendly facade. One day, I decided to take things up a notch. I asked John to join me for lunch, making it sound like a casual discussion about charity work. He agreed, with a smug smile on his face, thinking he was making progress. We found a quiet spot in the cafe. So John, I began, how are you finding the charity work? He shrugged, a confident look in his eyes. It's good, different but good. And Larry, I asked trying to keep my voice steady. What do you think of him? John looked surprised. Larry, he's okay, I guess. Why? I shrugged, trying to appear casual. Just curious. He's a bit of a mystery, isn't he? John laughed, clearly relieved. Yeah, he can be hard to figure out. We continued chatting about work and life, and I made sure to keep my tone neutral, not giving him any reason to be suspicious. In the days that followed, I continued to play along, keeping up the friendly act but never crossing the line. I was always on guard, always careful. It was a risky game, but one I was willing to play for now. One day, during one of our lunch meetings, 
John looked at me with a serious expression. You know, I've been thinking, John said. I raised an eyebrow, feeling a chill run down my spine. About what? I asked. He shrugged, looking uncomfortable. About us, about this thing between us. My heart skipped a beat. This was the moment I had been dreading. I forced a smile. And what is it that we have, John? He looked at me with a hopeful expression. I think we have something special. I felt a pang of guilt. John was falling into my trap, just as I had planned, but it didn't feel right. It didn't feel good. Still, I had to keep up the act, had to keep playing the game. So I smiled at John, a fake smile plastered on my face. Yes, John, I said, my voice barely a whisper. We do have something special. And just like that, the trap was set. The game was on, but at what cost? The Cold War at home with Larry was as icy as ever. We'd occasionally run into each other, exchange chilly greetings, and then retreat to our separate corners. Most nights, he stayed at his apartment, claiming it was more convenient for his work. One Friday afternoon, I called John. I laced my voice with warmth as fake as his documents, inviting him over to my place. He probably thought I was finally ready to give in to his advances. Poor guy, he couldn't have been more wrong. When John stepped into my home, he was greeted not by a seductive housewife, but by my old classmate, now a stern-faced police officer. The surprise on John's face was worth every bit of it. The officer checked John's papers, and as expected, they were as fake as a $5 bill. Now it was my turn to make a move. I offered John a choice. He could either stick with Larry and face the consequences of his fake documents, or he could switch sides and work for me. John's eyes darted between me and the officer, and after a moment of silence, he nodded. He agreed to my deal. Checkmate, Larry. With that, the real game began. I had Larry's pawn now playing on my side, but I knew this was just the beginning. Larry was a crafty man. He wouldn't go down without a fight. In the days that followed, I kept a close watch on John. Despite his agreement, I knew I couldn't fully trust him. He was a wild card, a potential threat, but for the time being, he was a useful one. One day, I called John to my office. We need to talk, I said, my tone serious. He looked at me, a hint of unease in his eyes. About what? About Larry, I replied. I need to know everything his plans, his strategies, everything. John hesitated, then nodded. Okay, I'll tell you everything. I knew I had my insider, and my counterattack was ready. But this was just the beginning the real battle was still ahead. Larry wouldn't go down without a fight, and I had to be prepared. This wasn't just a game anymore. It was war, and in war, there are no rules, only survival. Days turned into weeks, and I was getting anxious. I wanted to confront Larry, to show him I wasn't the pushover he thought I was. Tyler, who I turned to again, gave me some advice. Push Larry, he suggested. Make him think you've fallen into his trap. It was a gamble, but I was ready to play the game. So John and I staged a photo shoot. We posed in ways that could be seen as compromising, like proof of an affair, but we were careful. We kept the original photos, where everything was as innocent as a Friday school picnic. Once the photos were ready, I handed them to John. Give these to Larry, I said, passing him the envelope. Let him draw his own conclusions. John looked at me, concern on his face. Are you sure about this? He asked. Once you start this, there's no going back. I know, I replied, my voice firm. And I'm ready. The very next day, Larry was all smiles at dinner. He thought he'd caught me, that he had the upper hand, but he didn't say a word about it. I wasn't worried. I knew what was coming, and I was ready. Meanwhile, Tyler was on the case, digging up dirt on Larry and finding all the evidence we needed. He was good at his job, and I trusted him. Finally, Tyler called me. Larry's relaxed and has let his guard down, he said, his voice full of satisfaction. I've got him. I've got all the proof photos, videos, everything. I felt a surge of excitement. Good, 
I said, a smile spreading across my face. Let's bring him down. But I didn't confront Larry, not yet. I wanted him to think he was winning. I wanted to see the look on his face when he realized he'd been played. So I waited. I played the part of the dutiful wife, biding my time until Larry made his move. I knew it was coming, and I was ready. The clock was ticking towards the family dinner. I knew this was at the showdown. Strangely, I felt calm. I was ready. The dinner was at Larry's parents' luxury mansion, a huge estate that screamed old money. Larry was there, of course, playing the role of the perfect son and husband. But I knew the truth, and soon everyone else would too. We were halfway through the main course when Larry cleared his throat and stood up, a smug smile on his face. I have something to say, he announced, looking straight at me. He pulled out a set of photos of me with John and tossed them on the table like he was holding a winning hand. Proof, he said, his voice full of triumph, of my wife's infidelity. The room went silent. I could feel everyone's eyes on me, but I didn't flinch. I was ready for this. I calmly stood up and met Larry's gaze. Yes, I said, my voice steady. I know this man, but he's not my lover. He's an actor hired by you, Larry, to frame me. I pulled out my phone and pressed play. The room filled with John's voice, confessing everything. Larry's smile faded, and his eyes widened in shock, but I wasn't done. I pulled out my own set of photos and videos evidence of Larry's affairs. I tossed them on the table. What about these, Larry? I asked, my voice cold. Can you explain them? Larry stammered, trying to deny it, but the evidence was undeniable. His parents' faces turned to stone. My parents, who had been quiet until now, finally spoke up. You ungrateful brat, my father roared at Larry. We trusted you with our daughter, and this is how you repay us. Larry's mother was in tears. How could you, Larry? She sobbed. How could you do this to us, to her? The aftermath was swift. We divorced. Larry's parents, furious at their son's deceit, fired him from their company. His reputation was in ruins. As for me, I walked away with $7 million in compensation. Now, Larry is jobless, scrambling to piece his life back together, while I'm free. I'm enjoying the peace and quiet, the freedom from him. I won. I took on Larry and won. I outsmarted him and played his own game better than he did. And it feels good. It feels right. One day, my husband casually asked about our finances, wondering, how much money do we actually have in our safe? I laughed and guessed, probably around $700,000 in total. However, the very next day, when I returned home, I found a signed divorce document on the living room table. Both my husband and the safe had disappeared. My name is Olivia, and at 56 years old, I am a hard-working housewife who still puts in diligent hours at my job. My passion for saving money was instilled early by my mother, who opened a savings account for me when I was a child. She taught me that each deposit would make the balance in my bank book grow an idea I found incredibly appealing. Starting with just a dollar, I was thrilled to see my savings increase bit by bit as the interest accumulated, even if it was just a few cents each year. This early joy blossomed into a lifelong love for finance, guiding me to a career as a financial planner specializing in asset management. During college, a friend came to me with news about an old childhood friend, Scott, who was struggling with gambling debts and the financial burdens left by his parents. Intrigued, I agreed to meet Scott to offer some guidance. He was a charming man with an engaging smile. Despite his financial woes, there was something quite endearing about his troubled look. At my friend's urging, I helped him out, little knowing that this would lead to a complex series of events. Looking back, I might have had a small crush on Scott, but I could never have predicted the twists and turns that followed. I suggested he consolidate his debts and lower his monthly payments to get his finances back on track. Soon after, Scott and I began dating, despite my friend's warnings against it. We pressed on and eventually married. This decision would lead to unexpected challenges and dramatic changes in my life. 
I firmly believed that marrying Scott would enable us to tackle this family's financial issues together. Even though I had a stable income for someone my age, most of Scott's earnings went towards clearing his existing debts. I urged him to cut financial ties with his parents to avoid further debt accumulation. To help manage his expenses, I provided Scott with a monthly allowance of $2,000. When Scott decided to sever these financial dependencies, his decision was met with outrage from his mother, who berated him as an ungrateful son and expressed regret for his birth. His father also criticized me, labeling me a thieving cat. Exhausted by the constant pressure of his parents' debts, Scott finally reached his breaking point. He firmly told them he wasn't just an ATM and that he was doing his best to manage his own life. He returned to me, relieved to be free from the recurring arguments about money with his parents. Shortly after, we were blessed with the arrival of our son, Gary, a handsome boy who was the spitting image of his father and quickly became my pride and joy. As Gary grew, it became apparent that he had inherited some of Scott's traits, like his lack of discipline and indecisiveness. Over the years, Scott struggled with borrowing money from predatory lenders, dealing with loan sharks, and occasionally manipulating friends into lending him money for gambling. Despite these challenges, I managed to keep him on the right track, and after 23 years, we had managed to reduce his debt to about $13,000, nearing full repayment. However, a significant turning point occurred when Scott received a call that his father had collapsed and was hospitalized. Scott left work early and sent me a message apologizing for breaking our promise to avoid contact with his parents. He explained that his father had suffered a minor stroke. While it wasn't life-threatening, it was serious enough that he should not overexert himself. Scott expressed his desire to stay with his parents for a while to offer support during this difficult time. Despite my offer to join him, Scott insisted that I stay focused on my work and avoid the potential for mistreatment from his parents. This decision marked a poignant moment in our lives as we navigated the complexities of family obligations and personal commitments. I had provided Scott with some extra funds to help with hospital visits, anticipating that his parents might be struggling with medical bills. Since then, Scott began visiting his parents more often, each visit costing between $450 to $650 from my pocket. It appeared that my in-laws were facing financial hardships and depended on Scott for support. Though these amounts added up to roughly $3,200 to $3,800 each month, I decided to ignore it for the time being. A year had elapsed since my father-in-law's health scare, and both in-laws had visibly aged. I felt they needed someone to support them during this challenging time. As for me, my perennial hobby was always about saving money. One day, while I was pulling out my bank book from the safe with a smile, Scott, who usually paid little attention to my financial habits, curiously asked, Hey, how much money do we actually have in that bank account you always look at so happily? I casually replied, it's about $700,000 now. However, the following morning, I discovered divorce papers on the living room table, and both Scott and the safe had disappeared. At breakfast, despite the shock, I couldn't help but smile, realizing Scott had been eyeing the money in the safe. Moreover, he had planned to take the entire safe with him. Although not the sharpest tool in the shed, the thought of him trying to physically carry the entire safe almost made me burst out laughing. In our home, we have a red cat named Bella, and we installed a pet camera to watch her adorable antics, which brought joy to my days. During lunch breaks, I would tune in to watch the camera, finding delight in Bella's endearing behavior. One day, as I turned on the camera, an unexpected scene unfolded in our living room on a weekday. My in-laws and my husband Scott were having a surprising conversation. They marveled at the nice house Scott was living in and praised what they thought was his excellent salary. Scott's father, with a hint of pride, mentioned his own decent earnings but lamented that I controlled it. 
leaving him with just a $2,000 allowance. They comforted Scott, suggesting he deserved more and subtly hinting that he was being shortchanged by me. This revelation was startling and shed new light on the dynamics within our family. It seemed as though Scott, influenced by his parents, had forgotten all about the hard work I had put into managing his debts. He nodded in agreement with his parents, seemingly oblivious to the sacrifices I had made on his behalf. I wondered what thoughts were running through their minds. In the past, Scott had been overwhelmed by debts from his parents, obligated to hand over cash every month, which made it hard for him to manage his own finances. Now, he was complaining that it wasn't fair for him to receive only $1,000 a month, especially when his wife Mi had substantial savings in the bank. As Scott aired his grievances, my in-laws' eyes sparkled, eagerly exchanging glances as they awaited his reaction. How much is in that bank account of yours? They prodded, leaning forward with anticipation. Last I checked, I think it was around $510,000 or maybe $610,000, Scott responded vaguely. They pressed further, questioning whether that money rightfully belonged to him. Despite the considerable effort I had invested in reducing his debt from nearly $430,000 to just $15,000, it seemed that Scott's perspective had been swayed by his parents. His easygoing and indecisive nature, despite his charm, led him to side with their views. Witnessing this conversation through the pet camera, with my hard-earned savings potentially at risk, left me utterly devastated. Tears streamed down my face as I sat at my work desk, watching the scene unfold on my phone. I had been diligently managing our living expenses from Scott's income, allocating most of it to repaying his debts. The realization that all the efforts to secure our financial future were being undermined by his parents' manipulation was heart-wrenching. Despite providing Scott with a $1,000 monthly allowance for my own earnings and explaining this arrangement to him, it seemed as if he had forgotten everything over the past 23 years. I had given myself to him unreservedly, but the current circumstances left me feeling desolate and pitiful. My heart ached as though I was drowning in my own sorrow and I felt as if I was on the verge of breaking. Nevertheless, I made sure to record their conversation and sent the footage to my son. Overwhelmed by the emotional strain, I left work early that day, seeking solace at my usual bar, where I shared my woes with the bartender. His gentle words of comfort helped me, and in that moment, any lingering affection and intoxication for my husband dissipated. I expressed my thanks to the bartender, and looked forward to a more hopeful encounter in the future. After leaving the bar, I returned home with renewed determination. In my study, I contemplated how to retrieve the bank book that was hidden inside the safe a daunting task, but I was ready to devise a plan to prove that underestimating me was their mistake. It was clear that gathering evidence was the first crucial step. I diligently monitored the pet camera daily, and to my dismay, more unsettling truths began to emerge. My husband was bringing a young woman into our home during what were supposed to be his work hours, treating her as if she were a regular guest, approximately two times a week. Witnessing my husband's infidelity crushed any remaining desire for tranquility during my moments of watching our cat, Bella, who also seemed distressed, and began to avoid the area. This betrayal not only ruined my cherished relaxation time, but was also an unforgivable act of deceit. Determined to seek justice, I vowed to take stern action against them. One day, while monitoring the pet camera from work, I discovered it wasn't just the young woman causing trouble. My in-laws had returned to our house. I overheard them plotting, is everything arranged to take that bank book from Olivia? They asked each other with slay grins. This revelation fueled my resolve. I was more determined than ever to protect my interests and show them that I was not someone to be trifled with. The next steps were clear, safeguard my assets and confront the betrayal head-on. I responded with confidence when my father-in-law expressed concern about the weight of the safe, 
offering to help. I assured him that I could handle it, knowing well that my husband, Scott, though handsome, wasn't the sharpest. In my heart, I resolved to outmaneuver these people who were scheming at such depths. I imagined using the funds from the bank book to go to a casino as a family and rebuild our lives. Despite a pang of guilt about using Olivia's savings, my in-laws had convinced Scott that their actions were justified for his happiness. They urged him to swiftly divorce the woman he was seeing and leave the divorce papers on the table, eagerly anticipating the money from the bank book and the arrival of his new wife. Scott reluctantly agreed, and their unsettling plan began to unfold. Back at my office desk, sipping coffee, I recorded the scene unfolding on my phone screen. Oddly, I found myself somewhat understanding of their motives, realizing the extent they would go for money. Yet, I was no longer upset or sad. Instead, I felt a burning determination to give them a taste of their own medicine. The day finally came when my husband inquired about the money in the passbook kept in the vault. Casually, I informed him that it contained about half a million dollars. The next day, upon returning home, I discovered a signed divorce paper in the living room, and both my husband and the vault were gone. Smirking over breakfast, I acted swiftly. I filed the divorce papers and reached out to my son Gary immediately. Your father finally took the vault, I told him. I can't believe he actually managed to carry it, it's so heavy. This ironic twist, while frustrating, was also a vindication of sorts. I was ready to start the next chapter free from deceit and manipulation, armed with the truth and a clear conscience. After informing my son Gary about the unfolding situation with my husband, Scott, Gary suggested that it might be time to finally cut ties with him. He questioned whether Scott had managed to take everything from the vault. Little did Scott know, I had proactively moved all our savings to an online account, making the physical passbook he stole utterly worthless. Gary advised me to consider filing a police report and strongly recommended hiring a competent lawyer. Feeling grateful for his advice, I decided to sever my legal and emotional ties with Scott. I reached out to a lawyer, one who came highly recommended by my trusted private investigator. Exasperated yet determined, I handed over the recordings from our pet camera, which captured all of Scott's in his parents' underhanded discussions and actions. I provided these to both the police and the lawyer, eagerly awaiting their response to the clear evidence of deceit. Shortly after, Scott, in a state of panic, called me. He was frantic, questioning why the passbook was empty and where the half a million dollars had gone. I refused to engage with him directly. Calm and collected, I instructed him to communicate through my lawyer if he had any questions or concerns and then I blocked his number to prevent any further direct contact. I officially reported the incident to the police and provided the same recording to my lawyer, reinforcing the seriousness of the case. Feeling a sense of relief, I allowed myself a moment to reflect. Karma is a real pain, I thought, satisfied with the turn of events and reassured that justice would soon be served. Not long after taking these steps, I received a call from the police. They informed me that they had apprehended Scott, although unfortunately, the vault had been damaged. It appeared that in his desperation, Scott had forced it open, and in a fit of rage upon finding it empty, he or possibly his accomplices had set it on fire. The contents inside, though mostly old papers and some personal effects, were completely destroyed. Despite it being his first criminal offense, the nature of Scott's actions breaking into a safe attempted theft, and property damage meant that he spent several days in police custody. His parents, who were implicated in the planning, but not the direct action, were released but given a stern warning by the authorities. After his release, Scott's desperation spiraled further out of control. He broke into our former residence, demanding entry and claiming that everything was just a small prank. He insisted that we were still married, causing a significant scene that alarmed the neighbors and required police intervention once again. 
This final act of desperation by Scott only underscored the necessity of the precautions I had taken. It was clear that I had made the right decision to protect myself legally and financially. The entire ordeal was emotionally draining, but also a powerful reminder of my own resilience. I had managed to stay one step ahead throughout this tumultuous period, safeguarding not only my financial assets, but also my peace of mind. Now, as I looked forward to a quieter, more stable future, I felt a profound sense of closure and readiness to move forward. The tumult of the past months had been challenging, but it reaffirmed my capabilities and strength. I was ready to rebuild, focusing on my well-being and that of my son, free from the deceit and manipulation that had marred my previous life with Scott. After the latest incident involving my ex-husband, I didn't hesitate to act swiftly. I immediately called the police, and he was taken into custody once again. Following this, I contacted my lawyer to begin the legal proceedings necessary to obtain a restraining order against him and to explore the possibility of seeking compensation for the emotional distress caused by his infidelity and the subsequent chaos he brought into our lives. Although I had reservations about the feasibility of securing financial support from his economically strained family, I was resolved to pursue alimony. To my surprise, shortly after initiating these proceedings, his mistress transferred $18,000 in alimony. However, their relationship faltered soon after the vault incident, as the money depleted, so did their commitment to each other. It became painfully clear that my ex-husband, his parents, and his mistress were all struggling to keep their financial heads above water. My ex-husband, who was nearing retirement, unfortunately lost his job amidst this turmoil. His parents, trying to scrape by, found low-paying jobs in cleaning services, but were barely managing to make ends meet. Meanwhile, despite his efforts working three part-time jobs, my ex-husband's ongoing gambling addiction continued to undermine any semblance of financial stability. In light of these challenges, I stood firm on my alimony demands. I instructed my lawyer to convey a clear message. Real apologies must be demonstrated through actions, not just empty words. If they truly regretted their actions, they needed to show it tangibly, which in this context meant financially. Despite the opportunities I had offered my ex-husband to clear his debts and start a new opportunities he squandered under the influence of his gambling-addicted parents, I found myself reflecting on my own financial security. The $700,000 I had saved was the fruit of a lifetime of diligent saving and wise financial management. Realizing the importance of enjoying life while securing my future, I decided it was time to focus on personal fulfillment. I took pleasure in the simple joys of life, such as updating my bank book. I'd also opened a new bank account, ensuring better management and security of my finances. Currently, I lead a serene life with my cherished red cat, Bella, who provides constant companionship and comfort. My son occasionally visits, bringing with him stories of his own life adventures and his girlfriend which adds a layer of joy to my days. Now, my priorities center around self-care and planning for the future. One of my first actions was to consider the purchase of a new, larger vault a practical measure to ensure the safety of my accumulated savings. This step was not just about security, but also about reclaiming control over my life and my assets. With Bella by my side, I find myself more content and happier than I have ever been. The tumult of the past, marked by betrayal and financial strife, is now behind me. I look forward to a peaceful and fulfilling future, knowing that I have the resilience and independence to face whatever may come. This period of tranquility and empowerment is not just a phase, but a new chapter in my life, one that I embrace wholeheartedly as I continue to thrive and find happiness in the simplicity and security of my new life. You're useless. You can't even handle the chores or take care of the kids, let alone pay the alimony. Kyle had finally shown up at the hospital three weeks after my traffic accident, 
spouting these harsh words without showing any concern for me as I lay there in the hospital bed. At first, I had hoped Kyle came to visit me out of concern, but he proved to be a letdown. I sighed deeply. To be honest, I had already been thinking about getting a divorce. I didn't expect Kyle to bring it up now, but I guess I should be thankful it saved us both some trouble. Fine, I agreed quickly, which surprised Kyle. Little did he know, I was already one step ahead. I wanted to tell him that I knew what he was planning, and I was silently laughing at him in my head. My name is Sarah. I'm a 40-year-old housewife living with my husband, Kyle, and our 7-year-old daughter, Lisa. Kyle and I met during a group blind date and got married when I was 30. He was easy to talk to, and eventually, I fell for him and we started dating. Kyle was charming and the most handsome man at the table when we first met. When he expressed his interest in me, I felt flattered and proud. Kyle was incredibly romantic in our early days. He would surprise me with dessert plates and bouquets at fancy restaurants for my birthdays, take me on trips for our anniversaries, and write heartfelt letters at just the right moments. I felt so lucky to have him and eagerly accepted his marriage proposal imagining a life full of surprises and excitement even after marriage. But once we were married, things took a turn. Hey Sarah, my dinner isn't ready yet? I've been working all day, and you can't even have dinner prepared when I get back? You're so lazy. Once married life began, he started demanding like he was the master of the house and I was supposed to be his caretaker. At first, I was shocked by the change in him. I thought he was just joking. When we were dating, we used to laugh at each other's silly jokes. We imagined a sweet newlywed life where we'd call each other by cute nicknames and stay lovey-dovey even after having kids. But it turned out he wasn't joking at all. He treated me like a servant or something even worse. At first, I would laugh it off, thinking he was joking. But gradually, I realized he was serious. He really saw me as his caretaker and that was frightening. After we got married, I had to quit my job, and we depended on the money Kyle earned. I was scared that if I didn't do as he said, he might cut me off financially, so I felt trapped. Honestly, Kyle's income wasn't great. I was making more when I was working. Kyle only finished high school and jumped from one job to another. His unstable work history continued, quitting jobs every year or two. It seemed Kyle felt insecure about his background and took out his frustrations on me. I'm sorry I got delayed with some errands, I told him once. Don't make excuses, just hurry up and make it, Kyle replied, sitting down with a cold beer. This had become a common scene, but each time, I sighed and started cooking. My marriage made me miserable, but I managed to get by. The following year, our daughter Lisa was born, and my days became a series of struggles. As expected, Kyle didn't help much with Lisa. However, he would spoil her by buying her candy or toys she wanted. I tried to raise Lisa properly, so I scolded her when needed, which made her cling to Kyle even more. Lisa, you like daddy, don't you? Kyle asked her once. Yeah, daddy is cool, I love daddy, Lisa replied. I knew it, I'm super dad, Kyle said looking at me smugly. It was frustrating, but I couldn't help feeling glad that Lisa loved her father. I just sighed again. Despite his spoiling her, Kyle never attended any of Lisa's kindergarten events, like sports festivals or recitals. You know there's a parent-child race at Lisa's sports festival. Could you participate? I asked him. Huh? Why me? You're free that day, you do it, he responded. I'm busy with work every day, but the sports festival could be a great time for us to bond as parents. It's on a holiday, so you won't have to work, I said to Kyle. Shut up, we're already close enough. Maybe you should work on your relationship with Lisa. She thinks you're mean, you know. You might want to fix that, Kyle said, laughing as he left for work. Calling himself a super dad, yet he never shows up to school events. I was worried that Kyle's habit of being easy on himself but hard on others might influence Lisa. 
He continued to leave all the housework and childcare to me and was lazy at home. Now Lisa is five years old and ready to start elementary school, but Kyle was still jumping from job to job. He had just quit his factory job last month and moved to a food and beverage company. I'll be working weekends at my new job since it's in the food industry, he said. Looks like we'll hardly see each other then. Can't be helped, it's work, I replied. Honestly, I was relieved because I was tired of Kyle ordering me around on weekends. Now, I wouldn't have to be nagged by him to clean the floor or serve meals quickly. But if Kyle was out on weekends, Lisa would be sad. It's better for kids to spend holidays with the whole family. I have work, so please let Lisa know, Kyle said. I couldn't really argue with Kyle since he was the one bringing in the money. Reluctantly, I went to tell Lisa, I'm sorry, but Daddy won't be able to go out with you on his day off. I thought Lisa would be upset, so I told her with a frown. However, contrary to my expectations, Lisa seemed unconcerned. It's okay, if you're okay with it, then it's fine. You know he's not going to be here on all weekends, right? Daddy has been smelling strange lately, she said. A strange smell? I asked, puzzled. Lisa nodded and went back to her room. What on earth was she talking about? I've been so busy with housework and taking care of our child that I hadn't noticed much about Kyle lately. Our marriage was not like it used to be, and I tried to avoid being around Kyle to keep things calm. The strange smell Lisa mentioned might be from the factory, I thought. Factories often use special solvents, so it made sense that Kyle could come home with a weird smell. If that was the case, the smell would probably go away soon. Kids are really honest, which is what makes them so endearing. Despite what he said, Kyle started leaving the house early in the morning, even on his days off, which was odd. He also left every weekday. If he was working weekends, he should have a day off during the week. He left without saying anything to me, so I couldn't tell if he was going to work or not. I became curious about what he was doing, leaving so early even on his days off. One day, I asked Kyle, you seem to be going out every day off, what are you doing? Kyle looked confused for a moment, then answered in an annoyed tone while scratching his head, I'm working. I go to work voluntarily. Really, but you should take care of yourself or your body won't hold up, I replied. Shut up, don't complain about my job, Kyle snapped back. I didn't understand why he got so angry when he often complained about my housework and child rearing. I didn't believe what Kyle said. There's no way he, who usually avoids trouble, would go to work voluntarily on his days off. I knew this from watching him closely over the years. If he was that passionate about work, he would have stayed at his previous job longer. I also started paying attention to the strange smell that Lisa mentioned. Indeed, Kyle came home with a sweet, strong fragrance. This strange smell was not from the factory. Why hadn't I noticed this before? I blamed myself for being so naive and vowed not to make the same mistake again. From then on, I decided to watch Kyle more carefully especially on weekdays when he said he was going to work. He seemed to wake up an hour earlier than usual and took extra care grooming himself. He appeared to be in a good mood on those days, which varied from week to week, sometimes being on a Monday, sometimes on a Thursday. But it was clear that Kyle was happy on those days when he left the house. I went into his room to look for any clues. I felt like a detective searching a house. Since I always clean Kyle's room, I knew it well and didn't feel bad about snooping around. If Kyle had hidden anything, it would be in a place not easily seen. I searched carefully under the desk and bed. Finally, hidden in a candy tin in the closet, I found a bunch of letters. What were these? All the letters were from the same person, named Patricia. They had been sent through the mail. The oldest letter was from four months ago and the newest was from yesterday. As I read the letters, I saw phrases like, I regretted when we broke up but now, I really love you, and I want to go back to the time when I was with you. It sounded like something a lovesick teenager would say. At first, 
I thought maybe Kyle's ex-girlfriend was sending these letters on her own, but then I read a line that worried me. I'm glad you like me again. I'm looking forward to our next date. This was from last week. It looked like Kyle was seeing this Patricia today. He was definitely up to something. I took photos of the letters with my smartphone as evidence. I thought about taking the letters, but I didn't want to make Kyle suspicious. Even with these letters, I felt I didn't have enough proof. After thinking it over, I decided to hire a private investigator to check on Kyle. Three weeks later, the investigator gave me the results quickly. He brought photos of Kyle and Patricia close together in the park at night and even a recording of them saying, I love you, to each other. I accepted the facts calmly with solid proof in hand. I went to the municipal office and came back with a divorce form. Now that I knew Kyle was cheating, I had no reason to stay with him. I planned to confront him with the divorce papers the next time something happened. I returned home and let out a deep sigh. I was acting resolved, but honestly, I was heartbroken. I was upset with myself for having married someone as careless as Kyle. I was thinking about resting a bit before making dinner when my phone rang. Hello, yes? Ah, Sarah, do you have time to talk? Yes, what's going on? I was surprised to get a call from my father. He usually doesn't call me. Actually, your mother and I were talking yesterday, and we're thinking about transferring our assets to you soon. Huh? What happened? My father ran a company that sold imported goods to Japanese corporations. I was the daughter of a big company president, but I never told Kyle about this. I thought it would make me sound boastful, especially since Kyle jumped from one job to another. We're getting old and thinking about retiring. We thought about keeping the company going but didn't want to push it onto you, our only daughter, so we've decided to step back. I see. I felt guilty about not taking over the company, but my parents respected my decision and had planned for the future. I was touched by their thoughtfulness. We're thinking of handing over our assets to you. Our total wealth is $17 million, but we're fine with just $3 million. We've decided to give you the remaining $15 million. What? $15 million? I was shocked. That was more money than I could ever imagine earning in my lifetime. Yes, there will probably be inheritance tax, but you'll still have plenty left. You won't have to worry about living expenses for the rest of your life, Dad said. Thank you, I expressed my deepest gratitude to my father and mother and hung up. Soon, $17 million would be coming my way. With that money, I wouldn't have any worries, even if I divorced Kyle. No offense to him, but he probably couldn't earn that much. I felt relieved and was in a daze for a while. I glanced at the clock, it was 6 p.m. I realized I needed to make dinner and checked the fridge, but there were no groceries left. I got ready to go shopping at the supermarket. My heart was light, but I had also felt a sense of urgency that Kyle might come home soon. As I was hurrying across the last crosswalk to the supermarket, the light turned green. Watch out, someone yelled, but it was too late. My body was already in the air, and then I hit the ground hard. A sharp pain shot through my head, and without understanding what had happened, I lost consciousness. When I woke up, I was lying on a hospital bed. The first thing I saw when I opened my eyes were my parents and Lisa. Sarah, thank goodness, Mom said. Lisa was crying next to me. I gently stroked her head. You were hit by a car and broke both legs. They say it will take five months to fully recover. Five months. I felt dizzy thinking about being out of action for so long. From that day on, I was stuck in a wheelchair. Although the nurses took care of me, I felt frustrated and annoyed because I couldn't use my legs. During my stay in the hospital, my parents and friends visited me. My parents were taking care of Lisa now, since Kyle was always at work. I thought that was better for her. I was glad everyone visited, but Kyle never came. I started to doubt his care, thinking, aren't we husband and wife? However, one weeks after I was hospitalized, Kyle finally showed up. Hey, feeling good? 
Kyle asked sarcastically. Yes, man, it's a mess at home without me, I replied lightly. Kyle always complained about my housework as soon as he spoke, showing no empathy. I sighed, thinking he would be at least a little worried about me. What can I do? I was in a car accident. I snapped back when Kyle looked at me with disdain and said, You're useless if you can't do housework or take care of the child. That's the worst, and you should pay alimony. He said such horrible things to his hospitalized wife. Initially, I had hoped Kyle came to visit out of concern, but he was still disappointing. I sighed deeply. Honestly, I had been thinking about getting a divorce myself. I hadn't expected Kyle to bring up divorce today, but it saved me the trouble of arguing. Sure, I said, and Kyle looked surprised when I agreed. Unfortunately, I know what you're up to, I wanted to say, laughing inside. Here's a divorce notice. I took out a filled-in divorce form from a bag that my mother had brought and held it in front of Kyle's face. You already had this. Kyle was briefly confused, his eyes wide, but then he took the divorce notice from me and filled in his name and address right there. I felt relieved knowing I wouldn't have to see Kyle's face ever again. I wanted to tell them the feeling was mutual, but I just watched him leave silently. Probably, Kyle will remarry Patricia after the divorce. I don't know what kind of woman Patricia is, but it's sad to think she's going to marry someone as controlling and unpleasant as Kyle. I feel a bit guilty about Lisa, but deciding to leave was something I had thought about a long time ago. I promised myself I would take good care of Lisa. A month after Kyle left, my life was peaceful. The time without my husband nagging me felt like heaven. I was released from the hospital and started physical therapy. I decided to stay at my parents' house until my leg healed. My parents were angry at Kyle when they learned about the divorce, but they stopped pressing the issue when I told them I wanted to forget about him. Lissa doesn't seem lonely even without her father around and is going to elementary school happily. In the end, Lisa also noticed Kyle's domineering behavior and probably doesn't see him as a father anymore. I was convinced that divorcing Kyle was the right decision, but one afternoon, I got a call on my mobile phone. I ignored it when I saw Kyle's name, but the phone kept ringing nonstop. Eventually, I answered the call. Hey Sarah, when are you coming back? Kyle's words made no sense to me, and he sounded like he was about to start yelling. What do you mean, coming back? You remarried Patricia, didn't you? I replied. When I mentioned Patricia's name, Kyle sounded surprised and exclaimed, How do you know that? Did you think I didn't know you cheated? That's why I asked for alimony. Yes, that's right. But alimony and child support, I can't pay that. Why do I have to pay alimony anyway? You who never did the housework should be the one to pay, Kyle argued. I was shocked to hear Kyle's argument. I had asked for alimony and child support through a lawyer, but he hadn't paid yet. I knew Kyle didn't have a lot of money, but he should find a way to pay. Yet here he was, saying something ridiculous like I should be the one to pay alimony. I noticed your affair and gathered evidence. Did you see it from the lawyer? It seems that Kyle had already seen the evidence from the detective agency. That would make things easier, but him calling me was ridiculous. I wanted a divorce even before I found out about the affair because you never helped with housework or childcare and you complained all the time. I'm not your housekeeper, you know. But it's good you're married now. You have someone else to look after you. But here's the thing, Patricia can't do housework. Before we got married, she said, leave everything to me. But once we got married, her cooking is terrible and she doesn't clean. I would have been better off with you. Marry me again, after all, you don't have any money, right? Lissa liked me too, didn't she? Kyle said, which annoyed me. What are you talking about? You divorced me and remarried. You're her partner, not my responsibility. And sorry to say, Lisa doesn't like you, and I have money. Don't lie to me, there's no way you have money. You were a housewife, you can't live without me. I had no intentions of telling Kyle about the fortune I inherited from my parents, but faced with his aggressive attitude, 
I had no choice but to reveal it. My parents are the CEOs. Recently, I inherited their assets. It's around $52 million in total, so I can live without working for the rest of my life. I could almost visualize Kyle gaping on the other end of the phone as he heard about this fortune. You're lying. There's no way you have such a huge amount of money. It's true. If you want, I can have my parents tell you. With that, Kyle finally seemed to believe my words and fell silent. Then he suddenly yelled, If it's true, why didn't you tell me? Well, I wanted to tell you, but I knew about your affair and I thought the worst of you, so I thought it didn't matter at that point. I hadn't yet inherited the assets and there was no issue of property distribution. Kyle bit his lip in frustration. He probably never imagined I had such assets. He must be regretting that he should have never divorced me. But I didn't want to suffer his terrible behavior anymore. Can I hang up now? Please pay the alimony properly, reflect on your actions, and never call me again. Goodbye? With that, I hung up the phone. I immediately blocked Kyle's number so he couldn't call anymore. Mom, who were you talking to? Lisa walked into the room and asked curiously. Just a friend, I replied. But Lisa, do you want to go to the amusement park this weekend? Yes, Lisa smiled happily. Seeing her smile reminded me that her happiness was all that mattered to me. A few days later, I heard that Kyle had broken up with his new wife, Patricia. They argued because she wouldn't do housework, and Patricia ended up leaving him. Kyle, having been divorced twice in a short time, would probably find it hard to get married again. I hoped he would stay single for a while to prevent more people from getting hurt. After the divorce, Kyle lost his motivation and quit his job at the restaurant. He would probably find another job, but it might take him some time to get his life back on track. I felt a bit sorry for him, but his problems were his own doing. I blocked his calls so he couldn't ask me for money, and I avoided places where we used to go together. In my life, Kyle had virtually disappeared. Eventually, Kyle paid the alimony but ended up in debt. I don't know how he'll manage, but I hope he learns from his mistakes. I'm still living comfortably at my parents' house. They told us we could stay as long as we like. After my legs fully healed, I started part-time work at a local flower shop. Even though I don't need to work, I find it better to be active and leave the house. I work hard on weekdays and spend weekends having fun with Lisa and my parents. I feel more joy in life than before and want to keep living happily with the people I love. I cherish these happy moments, especially when I see Lisa smile.